Hello friends, welcome to this special bonus episode where you're just going to spend some time with me as I muse on this character from Stoicism called Epictetus and one particular work of his called the Enchiridion. I know it sounds like a baddie in the latest superhero movie, but we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about who he is, what he believed, and then very importantly, from my point of view, in the second half I'll be doing a sort of Christian apologetic, a response to the teaching of Epictetus, and particularly this book, this manual that he called the Encridian. Looking at it from a Christian perspective, what's good, what we can take from it, and perhaps where it reaches its limit. This is in response to a time I spent last night at a local philosophical society where we discussed this man in this one book. We meet once every three weeks and have a discussion round a famous philosopher or a famous piece of teaching in philosophy. The book we actually use for those meetings is Tom Butler Bowden's 50 Greatest Philosophers and the other books in his series of philosophy and politics and spirituality. And Epictetus kind of falls within that sphere of all three things, philosophy, politics, spirituality. So I do hope you find it interesting. I've just made the decision recently that I spend a good full day preparing for these meetings in the evenings and I learn a lot from them. I feel it's not a huge step extra to sort of pull all my thoughts together and the notes that I've made and try and come up with some sort of, well, really a Christian response to the teaching in this area. So you may find it helpful if you're studying philosophy or you're just interested in widening your perspective, your Christian perspective, on how Christianity responds to these sorts of things and these these sorts of ideas and teachings. I did discover last night that Epictetus is just one person among many who represents what is often called the third phase of Stoicism. There was an early Stoa phase covering the era from Zeno through to Antipater. Then there's a middle Stoa, as it's described, which includes teaching by Panaeteus and Poseidonus. And then the late Stoa, which includes our guy Epictetus and his writing, uh, distilled in his book called Encridian, but also people like Masunus Rufus and Seneca and, of course, Marcus Aurelius, who actually was a Roman philosopher who actually became Caesar, who also represented this later Stoa period. Because this philosophy group has been meeting for years, they have covered, before I joined, most of the main philosophers. What we tend to do is now go in and look at particular works related to these, these great thinkers. So let's begin with a little bit about Epictetus, who he was, and a little bit about him. Well, he was born around 50 AD, and it is estimated he died about 135 AD, and he was what is called a Greek Stoic philosopher. He was born into slavery at a place called Herapolis, which is in Phrygia, which is in present-day Western Turkey, but he lived in Rome as a slave. He actually lived there until his banishment when he went to a place called Nicopolis, which is in northwest Greece on the coast, or near to the coast, where he lived out the rest of his life. His teachings were not recorded by himself. They were in fact written down and published by a pupil of his called Arian, a guy who recorded, scribed his discourses, and they were distilled and put together in a work that was called the Enchiridion, which actually literally just means handbook. Epictetus taught that philosophy is a way of life and not simply a theoretical discipline. To Epictetus, all external events are beyond control and we should accept whatever happens calmly and dispassionately. However, individuals are responsible for their own actions, he taught, and those actions can be examined and our responses can be controlled, he believed, through rigorous self-discipline. In this episode, I shall be asking how this measures up against the Christian worldview and ask, is it helpful or is it even compatible with the view of God as revealed through the Bible. So let's just begin by taking a little bit of time looking at his biography, his life. As I said, he was born around 50 AD in Phrygia, which is modern day Turkey. And in Greek, his name simply means gained or acquired. 
a term actually used by Greek philosopher Plato in his laws as a word that means property, something that is added to. He spent his youth in Rome, a slave to a wealthy man. The man himself was actually personal secretary to Nero. Early in his life, Epictetus acquired a passion for philosophy and with the permission of his wealthy master, he studied philosophy, Stoic philosophy, specifically under a well-known Roman Stoic philosopher called Musconus Rufus. And by doing so, he became more educated and in that way, he would have in fact raised his social status and his value as a slave. At some point, we know he became disabled. Historian Oregon later wrote, that this was because his leg had been deliberately broken by his masters, but others wrote that it was in fact that he had in fact been disabled from childhood. Epictetus obtained his freedom sometime after the death of Nero in AD 68, and it was at that point he began to teach philosophy in and around Rome. Around AD 93, when the Roman Empire Domitian banished all philosophers from the city, Epictetus moved to Nicopolis, as I mentioned before, in northwest Greece, where he in fact founded his own school of philosophy. His most famous pupil was this guy Arian, who studied under him as a young man, probably studying around AD 108, and it was he who claimed to have written his famous discourses, which he based on the notes he took during Epictetus' lectures. Arian argued that his discourses should be considered as important as the early Socratic literature. Arian also described Epictetus as a powerful speaker, one who could, quote, induce his listener to feel what Epictetus wanted him to feel. Many eminent figures of that day sought conversations with him, including the Emperor Hadrian, who was said to become a friend of his. He lived a life of simplicity and he had few possessions, and he lived alone for a long time, but in his old age it is recorded he adopted a friend's child, who would otherwise have been left to die, and he raised him with the aid of an unnamed woman. It is unclear whether Epictetus and she were actually married, but we do know that he raised the child and also that he died sometimes around AD 135. So thinking about what he thought and taught. Well, it's important firstly to say that no direct writings by Epictetus himself are known. His discourses that exist were transcribed and compiled, as I said, by his pupil Arian. The main work is something called The Discourses, which is four books which still remain out of what originally was believed to be it. Arian also compiled a popular digest of his entire teaching, distilled if you like, and he entitled it The Encridion, the handbook as it's translated. Arian was recorded as saying, whatever I heard him say, I used to write down, word for word as best I could, endeavoring to preserve it as a memorial for my own future use. Epictetus maintains that the foundation of all philosophy is self-knowledge and that our conviction of our ignorance and naivety ought to be the first subject of our study. Logic, he says, provides valid reasoning and certainty in judgment, but is subordinate always to practical needs. The first and foremost necessary part of philosophy would always concern the application of doctrine. For example, very straightforwardly, that it should work out with people as a starting point, not actually lying. Both in his lengthier discourses and in this, the Incridian, he begins by calling us to recognise and distinguish between those things in our power and those things that are not in our power. Saying what lies within our power are our opinions, our impulses, our desires and our aversions. And on the contrary, what we do not have control over is things like, well, our own bodies, our possessions, or even any glory or power that we might perceive we might have among other people. Any delusion, as he describes it in these points, he said, will lead to the greatest errors, great misfortune, troubles, to what he actually refers to as slavery of the soul, which is interesting because he was, of course, a bonded slave physically himself only thing that should be the object of our serious pursuit he believed should be found within ourselves the determination between what is good and what is not good can only be made by recognizing where it lies within our capacity to choose 
It is in this choice that allows us to act and gives us the kind of freedom that only human beings have. For Epictetus, these things are determined by a reason, which is all of our facilities and how it sees and tests itself and everything else. He writes, I quote, You are the impression and not at all the things you appear to be. And he called people to examine these things and test everything by these rules. When troubled by loss, he believes an individual can get to a point where they can say to themselves, well, I've lost nothing that belongs to me. It was not something that was mine in the first place. It was simply something not mine that was torn from me. And that something that in reality never had any power over me, as he would put it, has now left me. It's gone. He even said, what is there to cry and weep about? What misfortune or quarrel or a complaint? All these things are just opinions founded on the delusion, on something that we were never subject or was within our own choice. By refusing to classify anything as good and evil, we there can escape its effect upon us, he wrote and believed. Reason alone is good enough, he thought. Evil is irrational and it should be intolerable to the rational mindset. To reject and repel evil by the good is the noble contest in which humans should engage. But it is not an easy task, but he wrote that he believed it promised true freedom and a peace of mind in doing so. Epictetus also recognised that this preoccupation of good and evil was not something that everybody experienced. Good alone is profitable and be desired, and evil is hurtful and be, to be avoided. People, by entertaining different and conflicting opinions of what is good, and what they judge to be particularly good, based on their emotions, means that people often end up contradicting themselves and each other. He recognised in the idea of this essence of God, divinity if you like, goodness, and that the god or gods gave us the soul and the ability to reason, and it is by that knowledge our responses to the things of this world come. And by that we can attain to greatness. He believed that one day you might be equal with the gods. So his view is that you should cultivate your mind with great attention, and by getting to a point where you actually wish for nothing other than what God's will, remember that God for him was just an embodiment of the laws of universe, but by striving for that, that you could truly be free. And then what will come to pass will always be according to your desires. He also taught that every individual is connected with the world and the universe was created from the perspective of universal harmony, that embodiment of logos, the laws of the universe lay behind it. Wise people there, for he thought, will not be in the business of just pursuing what their own desires are, but will be subject, in a sense, to this rightful order of the world, which then worked out in practical ways that meant people, he believed, should conduct their lives fully fulfilling all the duties laid upon them as children, brothers, sisters, parents, and indeed, of course, citizens, which is where it stepped over into politics. The good person, he believed, the wise person, would thereby be able to foresee the f a future where they could be at peace and content in everything, even in their attitudes towards sickness and, yes, even their own death, recognising that all of that is the correct order of the universe. We are like travellers or guests at an inn, he said, but guests at a stranger's table. And whatever is offered us, we should take with thankfulness, whatever is offered us. And in living this way, he said, we are worthy guests of the gods and sharers in their power. However, this meant he also taught that anyone who finds life intolerable is free to quit it. Suicide was a high thing. But the Stoic will never find life intolerable and will be the poor person who will complain to no one about anything or grumble with God, let alone other people. It's only the ignorant person, he believed, who finds fault with their situation or with others. And any and every desire within us to grumble about anything, he actually said, degrades us and renders us slaves of what we're desiring. The final entry of this Incredi in this handbook of his that we're looking at tells us, upon all occasions we ought to have these maxims ready at hand. So this book, The Incredian, is really just his ideas distilled into a series of short, punctuated sentences and pieces of advice, not dissimilar to the book of Proverbs in the Bible. And it's not a long book, 
It takes less than an hour to read, but it's seen by many and it has re been reconstituted by many, particularly in this new age of stoic influence coaching as a basis for a manual for life. So let's just take a look at his influence because his influence is clearly important, not just back in the day, in his day, but right through to modern times. His influence can be seen, in fact, in the philosophy of his day, but also in literature, both classic and even modern. It also, we can see it today in cinema. Interestingly, aspects of it are used in military and special services training. It's also made a, a dramatic reappearance in modern secular psychology. So let's just examine these influences for a minute and where they sit. So if we look at it, first of all, in philosophy, well, the Stoic approach, which comes along later, of which he was one of the compilers of that thought and distillers of that thought, was a huge departure from the teaching of Socrates before him. Socrates, of course, many think of as the greatest Greek philosopher and is indeed one of the founders of Western theology. Socrates believed that the pursuit of wisdom and self-knowledge was the highest goal of human existence. And this is in stark contrast to the Stoic emphasis, which is very much on self-reliance and a detachment from emotions. The philosophy of Epictetus was very influential in creating a new strand of thought and even influenced the Roman emperor of the time, Morris Aurelius, who often quoted Epictetus later in his writings. Many would also cite him as having an influence on the philosophers of the French Enlightenment, people like Voltaire, Montesquieu, Diderot and Holbach, all read the Encridian and all quoted it heavily when they were students. But we also see his influence in literature, both classic, early and modern. Clearly it influenced the classical writings of his day and is seen as a development of the foundations of Western philosophy in the Greek philosophical movement. But even in modern literature, the philosophy of Epictetus plays a key role in the 1998 novel A Man and Fool by Tom Wolfe. The character Conrad, who appeared in that award-winning novel, is one who, through a series of mishaps, finds himself in jail and accidentally there acquires a copy of the Enchiridion and uh, this stoic manual and he discovers that that philosophy strengthens him and enables him to endure the brutality of the prison environment. He experiences what Joseph Campbell would later classify as the hero journey and the call to action, that call to be a strong, honourable and in effect undefeatable protagonist which is seen, which is seen to trace a line through modern history, particularly cinema. There's a line from the Enchiridion used in the title quotation in the life and opinions of Tristram Shandy, as well as The Gentleman by Lauren Stern, which they both translate to not things but opinions about things is what trouble men. Epictetus is also mentioned in a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce. In the fifth chapter of the novel, the main protagonist, Stephen Daedalus, discusses Epictetus's famous lamp motif with the dean of his college. That's the idea of a favourite lamp being broken, yet at the same time not allowing yourself to get upset about that. But in modern cinema, we also see its influence. This trope is continually applied in today's many superhero films. This again is what is called to and referred to as the hero journey and the call to action, whereby you see our initially ordinary or even a feeble character rise to become strong, honourable and an undefeatable protagonist. Furthermore, both the ideas and even the figure of Epictetus is a significant influence on the main character in Ridley Scott's 2000 film Gladiator and his more recent reworking of the Alien franchise in his follow-up Pro Prometheus. But his influence has also appeared in military service training, especially those in the special services like the SAS in the UK, and I would imagine the equivalent would be Navy SEALs is in America. Within the special forces group, a stoic philosophy is nurtured 
as an attempt to equip soldiers to withstand capture and even torture. In fact, very famously, US prisoner of war James Stockdale claimed he was able to retain his sanity during capture by relying on the philosophy of Epictetus. James Stockdale was a fighter pilot who was shot down while serving in Vietnam and he was influenced by Epictetus and was introduced to his work while he studied as a student at Stanford University. In his autobiography called Courage Under Fire, it was said, as I quote, he tested Epictetus's doctrines in the laboratory of human behaviour. Stockdale, in fact, credits Epictetus with helping him endure his seven and a half years in captivity, which included lengthy periods of torture and four years that he spent alone in solitary confinement. When he was shot down, he reportedly said to himself, I have left the world of technology and entered the world of Epictetus. But we also see its influence in secular psychology. Psychologist Alan Ellis, the founder of Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, actually credits Epictetus with providing the foundation upon which his system of psychotherapy is based. And I myself have actually attended in the past training courses on CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and I've also read about mindfulness, and I can also detect a philosophical through line into those therapies, particularly with CBT. Okay, so that's the guy, that's what he believed, and that's the background of his influences. But what about a Christian response to it? What as Christians do we feel about this writing? Well, in terms of Christian history, for many centuries, the Enchiridion maintained a fair degree of, of authority among both pagans and Christians alike. A Christian, what we would today describe as a bishop, a guy called Simplicus of Cilicia, he wrote a commentary upon it in the 6th century, where controversially, even then, he tried to syncretize it with Christian thought. In the Byzantine era, many Christian writers frequently wrote paraphrases of it. Over 100 manuscripts of the Enchiridion survive today, many of them reworkings dated from the 14th century. In fact, these Christianized versions of it, they date back as far as the 10th and 11th century, and most are found to originate within the Eastern Byzantine Christian world, which appeared to, for, for hundreds of years to have more preference for creating Christianized versions of Greek philosophy, particularly Stoic philosophy. The Enchiridion wasn't actually translated into Latin until a guy called Niccolo Perotti did it in 1450 and then again later in 1479 by, by Angelo Polisanio. So it seemed there was more of an attraction to this Stoic mindset in the Eastern, in what would become the Orthodox Church, than in the Western, what at that time was the Latinized Church. This book that we particularly focused on for our discussion together, and I'm focusing on today, is Epictetus's Enchiridion. And as I said, it's basically a Stoic handbook that outlines the principles and practices of Stoicism, which is a philosophy that at heart emphasizes rationality, self-control, and a detachment from external events, almost, some would say, to the point of detachment from physical reality. The Enchiridion is definitely positioned and offers itself as a guidebook for living what the Stoic philosophers called a quote-unquote virtuous life. It has been extremely influential in shaping thinking of many, many people throughout history, including some Christians. However, I believe there are potential conflicts between Stoicism and Christianity that arise when one considers particularly and recognises its different view on God, the human soul, and the nature of what good, or what the Stoic philosophers would call virtue, actually is. So my contention is that Stoicism as a whole, particularly embodied in the Enchiridion, well, it has a different view of God, it has a different view of the human soul, emphasises virtue rather than love, and it also has a different view on the afterlife, and even very much so a different view of fatalism as up to being able to express free will. And finally, I think it actually has a different view 
on human nature itself and how that is expressed through emotions both good and bad. So let's just, in the second half of this talk, let's look at the differences between a Stoic worldview and a Christian worldview. Well, one of the primary conflicts and differences between Stoicism and Christianity is its different view of God. For Stoics, the universe is governed by a rational principle, which they call the Logos. The Logos is simply an impersonal force that orders the universe and provides a basis for ethical living. Epictetus emphasizes the importance of aligning oneself with that Logos, yeah, stating that we should not be like the vulgar who apply the name of God to that which is of no existence. In other words, Stoics do not believe in a personal God, a God who intervenes in the world, but rather they just believe in a rational, impersonal, rational force that governs things, governs the world, if you like. But however, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, said this, this is Romans 8, 28 to 39. But we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, when he predestined these, he also called whom he called these he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even now at the right hand of God, and who also makes intercession for us, who can separate us from the love of God in Christ, shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who have loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So we can see definitely in this passage Christian belief emphasizes belief in a personal God, a God who cares about each individual. It asserts that nothing can separate us from that God of love and that God works all things together for good for those that love him. And this very much is a contrast with the Stoic belief in an impersonal force governing the universe. Christianity is at heart a belief based on a personal God who actually created the universe and is actively still involved in it. Christians believe that God is loving and merciful and he desires a personal relationship with each individual. And this is a fundamental difference between Stoicism and Christianity. And it will, in the outworking in the everyday, lead to many potential conflict touch points when we consider things like the role of prayer and the role of worship in each tradition. Stoics may engage in meditation or contemplation as a means of what they would believe might align them better with this principle of the Logos. However, Christians believe that prayer and worship are necessary for cultivating a relationship with God. For Christians, it's not enough to simply live according to a set of ethical principles. One must also have faith in God and seek to know him personally. You will also find a different view of the human soul. You see another potential conflict arises when one considers the different ideas of what the human soul is. For Stoics, the soul is just seen as a rational indwelling principle, something that is capable of understanding the Logos and living in accordance with it, but probably no more than that. The goal of Stoicism is simply to cultivate what they call a quote-unquote virtuous soul, but one that is by necessity detached from the external. In other words, detached from the real world. And they would suggest we focus on living a life of wisdom expressed through self-control. 
Epictetus writes, happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things will are within our control or some things that are not. That's the opening phrase of his manual, the Incridian. In other words, Stoics believe that the key to happiness and freedom is to focus on what is within our control. In other words, just our thoughts and our actions. And therefore we are to detach ourselves completely from what is not, from all external events and circumstances and our reactions or emotional responses to them. But Christianity, on the other hand, it views this human soul as something that was created by God and in fact is in need of redemption. Christians believe that the soul has fallen away from God's original created purpose and needs salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The goal of Christianity is not simply to cultivate this quote-unquote virtuous soul, but it is in fact to have that soul reconciled to God and to live a life of service and love to others in thanksgiving that that has taken place. So again, this leads to many potential conflicts when considering the role of self-control and its position within each tradition. Stoics see self-control as a means of achieving happiness and freedom. But Christian Christians, however, see it as the means and the main motivation for living a life of love and service to others. So we then get into this whole debate rising that there's a very different view. There's sort of a conflict point between is it virtue or is it love? This is a real potential conflict area because it has a completely different view on what is the nature of virtue. For Stoics, this virtue that they aim for is just seen as a matter of living it in accordance with the divine principle, the Logos, and cultivating wisdom, and of course, the big thing with them, self-control. Epictetus wrote, it is not what happens to you that matters, but how you react to it. In other words, Stoics believe that they should aim to achieve a place where they can actually deny the sensory emotional reality of what they're experiencing in order to create their own version of reality, one in which they can avoid suffering or at least remain cold and unmoved by it. Augustine, an early theologian and philosopher, he spoke against this because he believed that love was the key to living a virtuous life rather than the self-control and detachment, which is a completely different perspective and really contrasts with the stoic emphasis on reasonable self-control leading to the highest virtues. Augustine of Hippo represents the opposite of that when he says love and do what you will. 1 Corinthians, Paul, he writes about this at length, about how love is in fact the greatest gift of God and the greatest thing to be aimed for. Writing this, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. And it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know today in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now live and abide in faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. This amazing passage by Paul emphasizes the importance of love above all else. It asserts that even if one has great knowledge, faith, self-control, 
with love. These virtues in and of themselves actually mean nothing. And that's a huge contrast with the Stoic emphasis on reason and self-control, not only as being the highest virtue, but as being an end in itself. But also, another key difference between Stoicism and Christianity is their respective view on God and the afterlife. In Stoicism, the universe is seen, as I said, as this ordinary rational system governed by an impersonal force. Again, it's called the Logos. The Stoics believed that the goal of human life was to live in harmony with this, which meant for them accepting whatever fate had in store for them and striving to be virtuous in all their actions. But in contrast, Christianity teaches that there is in fact a God who is a personal God. He has personality and it was he who created the universe and that he cares about each individual person and that there, because of that, there is indeed an afterlife and that following salvation through Christ, the purpose of human life is to love and serve God and that there is the afterlife where people will be judged according to their deeds. J.R.R. Tolkien, that famous English writer of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, he was in fact professor of medieval literature and he believed in the value of the individual and the uniqueness of each person's journey through life and points out the contrast, the stoic emphasis on conforming to the rational and predetermined order of the universe. Famously saying, putting into the words of both his character in The Hobbit but also in his written essays that indeed all that is gold does not glitter and all those who wander are not necessarily lost. Also Goethe, the famous German philosopher and poet and writer, he believed that humans are not predestined by some pre-existing plan of fate, but that we all have the capacity to shape our own lives under God. And this is in sharp contrast to the Stoic belief in the unchanging, predetermined fate. Goethe wrote, If God had wants me otherwise, he will create me otherwise. In other words, God is actively involved in the refining of the person and the personality. So a lot of this comes down to, do we have a fatalistic view of the world or do we believe in free will? And this is another fundamental difference in the worldview that leads to a very direct and obvious conflict between what Stoicism believed and taught and what Christianity believes and taught. For example, in the Enchiridion, Epictetus writes, do not seek to have things happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do, and all will be well with you. Well, that may sound like good advice for accepting things out of one's control, but it can also be interpreted as wholly fatalistic and as an opposition to the Christian belief, well, if nothing less, our belief in the power of prayer and the possibility always of divine intervention in situations that are difficult. Christians actually believe and the Bible teaches that they can ask God to intervene in their lives and that God has the power to change the course of events. Stoics, on the other hand, would see such a request as going against their view of the natural order of things and they would pretty much view that as pointless. Epictetus advises his followers rather just to accept whatever fate has in store for them and strive to be virtuous and unemotional in their response and their actions. Christians, on the other hand, believe that they can go to God when times are hard and ask God to intervene in their lives and that God has the power to change the course of events. Now, sometimes, of course, it may not be in the way we imagine or wish or sometimes it may not be within the time frame or sometimes God will allow us to go through these trials in order to teach us something. But underpinning that is always the belief that God has the power to step in and change the course of events. In history. Maurice Blondel, a famous French philosopher and Christian, believed that life is a process of continual growth and discovery rather than this predetermined course of events that the Stoics believe. The Stoics wrote and taught and believed in an unchanging, predetermined fate that affected and fell upon everyone. Blondel, in his manual Le Action, summed the Christian response to this up. Perfectly, I believe, when he said the world was not created once and for all time for each of us individually. There are added to it in the course of our life things which we have never had any suspicion or understanding of. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, in a similar way, encapsulates this by recording the words of Jesus as basically saying, do not worry. 
Let me read to you from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And remember, this is Jesus himself speaking. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about the body and what you will put on it. Okay, we're okay with stoicism up to this point, are we? Then he says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Okay, so it's stoicism now, but it's turning and it's having a personal swing on it, hasn't it? Are you not of more value than they? Which of you can be worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the valley, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, we're really getting a step away from Stoicism now. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is here and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, then how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is for the day is its own trouble. So there you see in this passage, Jesus encourages his followers not to worry about material possessions in the future, but to trust in God's provision. It asserts that God knows our needs and will in fact take care of them. And this contrasts with the stoic acceptance of what appears on the surface initially to be similar on accepting, but as they would put it, just fate and not striving to try and change the course of events. But with Christ teaching it's much, much more than that and much more personalised than that. It's a God who will step in and underpins the whole creative process. George Berenos, a French writer and Christian philosopher, believed that the Christian faith, as lived, is always an ongoing process and that it is not something that can ever be lost, but something that can simply be neglected or forgotten by us. Writing in his diary, he wrote, Faith is not a thing which one loses. We merely cease to shape our lives by it. Another potential conflict between Stoicism and Christianity is their view on the nature of humanity. Christians view humans as fundamentally flawed due to this idea of original sin and that they are in need of redemption through faith in Jesus Christ. While both Stoicism and Christianity may emphasise to agree the importance of self-control, obviously the Stoicists to a much higher degree, the reasons for doing this, the motivations for expressing self-control are very different. For Stoic self-control is necessary to live in accordance with reason and logic, but for Christian self-control is a way and a means of avoiding sin and not allowing God to shape our lives anymore, or live, to put it very simply, a holy life. The difference in motivation will lead to huge conflicts, huge differences in how one approaches various situations or decisions we have to make in life. Stoicism places its main emphasis absolutely on the individual and their own inner strength and their self-reliance. It's why the Romans and the Roman army loved it so much and incorporated it into their system. But in contrast, you see, Christianity emphasizes community and the importance of compassion for others. Stoicism teaches that one should strive for inner peace and tranquility by striving and getting to the point where you can separate oneself from others and be totally self-reliant. But Christianity teaches that we should love one another and be actively involved in each other's lives. The two philosophies can be brought into tension and on occasion in history even to out-and-out conflict with each other when it comes to the importance of how much importance should be placed on the individual versus the well-being of others. Paul, writing indirectly on this issue, but very clearly dealing with the issues that this raises in Colossians chapter 3, says this, But now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
filthy language, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man. In other words, that's the person who's not made a decision to accept Christ as their saviour, who's not put off these old ways. So that though they put off the old man, as Paul calls it, with his deeds and has put on the new man who is now renewed in his knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So there's the difference there. Whether they now are Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ in all and of all. Therefore, we as the elect of God, holy and beloved, so this is how we're to respond to reaching this point where we've been able to control all these emotions of anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, etc. that he named. We, he says we are to put on, so having put off those things, we are now to put on tender mercies, replace them with kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, so it's getting practical now, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do also. But in all things, he says, in all things put on love which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you were called into one body, and be thankful. And the one body he's referring to is the community of faith, the church, if you like, use its modern word. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing with grace in your heart to the Lord, and whatever you do, in word or deed, Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This passage by Paul positions the Christian life, this life of what the Stoics would call virtue, within the civic community life. It emphasises the importance of community and of loving others. It encourages Christians to be motivated by gaining control of these negative emotions and responses and replacing them by putting on, as he said, things like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, and to bear with one another and to forgive each other when we're not achieving those levels. And this totally contrasts with the Stoic emphasis of individualistic self-reliance which is actually positioned with a detachment from other people. So there is a whole different worldview, a huge conflict between what our very emotions are. Are they good? Are they bad? Or are they both? Stoics believe that emotions such as fear, anger and sadness, they actually ultimately believe they're irrational and they should be suppressed because of that. By doing that, you are able to live what they would call this virtuous life. But in contrast, Christianity teaches that emotions are a natural part of the human experience and it is important to be honest about them. So while both philosophies emphasise the importance of self-awareness of these negative traits, the way in which they approach these emotions is very different. Christians believe that emotions can be recognised, sometimes even negative ones, of being in and of themselves good or ill. But whenever they arrive, and whatever our motivation is, it is important that we channel them in a healthy way. Let me try and draw this together and reach a bit of a conclusion. It is definitely true that Epictetus in Cridians contains many, many valuable teachings on things like showing endurance in the face of adversity. But there are still, for Christians, many, many conflicts between Stoicism and Christianity when viewed from a Christian perspective. Certainly Stoicism can be helpful in approaching people, in helping people detach from unnecessary overdramatic reactions to negative things in their lives. So it can, in a sense, get you 80% of the way there, but it won't get you over those final hurdles in life, I believe. The conflicts that exist between it and Christianity are many and varied. It has a different view of God, a different view of the afterlife, a different view on the nature of humanity, a different view on the importance of community, and even on the roles of emotion. You could humorously say, but apart from those things, it's similar. Now, I do believe that Christians, we can certainly learn practically from Stoicism, but it's important when we approach it, we approach it with a biblical eye open and aware 
of not just its intersection points where it does agree with the Christian faith to a degree, but also recognise them and have real insight to that there are some very real barriers that exist between these two perspectives. In summary, I suppose I would say that the Christian worldview, when taken at a deep level, becomes in a sense really, if I'm frank with you, incompatible with someone who would choose to take a wholly Stoic outlook on the world. There are truths within it, but it is not truth in the Christian sense of a world. You see, the Christian emphasis on the importance of things like community, trust in God, and of course, ultimately love, that's at odds with the Stoic emphasis of individual self-sufficiency and its detachment. Additionally, as Christians, we know and assert the importance of emotions, and we also know the value of each individual person as being a person created in the image of God and of value to him. And those sorts of ideas are not even within the mindset or the purview of a stoical attitude towards life. Anyway, that's it. I hope you find it helpful. I do stress I'm not a philosopher. I'm a simple Bible teacher, preacher and pastor. But I do hope some of the insights I've given you here are helpful in understanding your position as a Christian and having a reasonable and logical response when facing or meeting people who adopt this, and it's becoming very fashionable recently, this wholly stoical worldview and outlook on life. So thank you for this time together and keep an eye out on my Patreon page for more similar occasional talks and bonus episodes like this. And with that said, I'll just say bye for now. Bye-bye now.